Today's speaker, we're welcoming uh, Dr. Liam Baker of Stellenbosch University. Um, Liam was introduced to Olympiad mathematics in high school and upon leaving school knew that he would be a professional mathematician one day. He studied his BSc in honors at the University of Cape Town, after which he completed his uh, MSc at Stellenbosch University. He then worked for two years in the financial and data science industries in Johannesburg before returning to Stellenbosch University to complete his PhD in mathematics. He now lectures at Stellenbosch University and continues to tutor the next generation of Olympiad math students. His research interests include number theory, linear algebra, and big data anal analytics. And today he will be presenting a seminar on self-led learning and mathematics competitions. Um, so please join me in welcoming today's presenter. Um, Liam, if you could just turn on your video and over to you. Thank you. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the seminar. Um, I hope it's going to be interesting and maybe even a little informative. And yeah, maybe it'll change a little in a little bit the way we teach mathematics. Okay, so let's uh, get to the contents. Uh, so this is the plan for today or for the seminar. Uh, give a short biography of who I am. Uh, so where, how I got into mathematics through the competitions and so on, and how that has impacted my undergraduate, postgraduate studies and so on. Uh, then what I learned from that experience in the second section, learning how to learn mathematics, and then some ideas for how we can apply those lesson, lessons when we teach mathematics to high school or university age students from there. Um, Diane said that the seminar itself would be about 45 minutes and then 50 minutes of questions. Uh, I don't have that much planned to say myself. So we, this part, the first part of it might be less than 45 minutes, but that just means we have more time for discussions and questions at the end. So here we go. Biography of me. Uh, I grew up in Mitchell's Plain, which is in the Cape Town area, uh, about half an hour maybe from Stellenbosch. I grew up there in a house with my mom and my brother and my uncle and my grandma. I went to primary school in a local school there called Imperial Primary. I was generally good at academics but like not specifically into mathematics. And from then onwards, I went to high school uh, at another local school called, <clears throat> called Mondale High. And in that first year is when I first got experience to competition mathematics uh, through the yearly UCT maths competition because my school, Mondale, used to send students every year. So I took part in that. I did kind of well um, in grade eight. I think I got to like 11th place or something in the grade. Um, and because of that, I got invited to this weekly math circle that was held at UCT on a Wednesday afternoon. And what would happen there is that whoever is presenting or the coach for that week, they would uh, kind of give a lecture on a particular Olympiad maths topic. And we would hear about these maths competitions like the South African Maths Olympiad. And the, at that time, they had a national training program, which would serve as uh, just getting a pool of students from, from which they would select teams for the International Maths Olympiad and the Pan-African Maths Olympiad. And uh, yeah, so a few things happened there. I heard about like 
I could take part in these big maths competitions and like maybe even represent my country. That would be amazing. And another thing, which is, I guess, more important for this seminar is that I learned, I think I learned to love maths at those weekly math circles. Um, I learned the thrill of being given a problem and that I have no idea how to solve or how to tackle it. And through just trying different things and maybe using some theorem that I learned recently, I would be able to solve the problem and I would get that thrill or the little rush of having solved the problem. So that's my experience of Olympiad mathematics. I eventually, in grade 11, grade 12, I managed to be on the South African team. And yes, that was my high school math competition experience. And then after leaving high school, I went to university, as Dan said, I started at UCT and I did first year, second year, third year, so on, uh, all going into a BSc in mathematics and applied maths. And I think one of the things that was quite different for me compared to the other, uh, my other colleagues is not the right words, the students that I was studying with that were in the same year as me during my time at UCT is that, okay, I don't mean this to be bragging, but I believe that because of my experience with competition maths, university level, the university level math experience was kind of easy for me. Uh, not that I knew the material already because I didn't know the material. Uh, when I was sitting learning about what a metric space is, I would be learning it at the same time as everyone else. But I believe I learned some things during my time in competition maths, which helped me to learn how to learn maths in a better way. And that we can talk about later on in the seminar. Uh, so that was my undergrad and honors and master's experience. Now I said, yeah, not quite after competitions because I continued to be involved in these maths competitions uh, and I still am now. Uh, involved in the sense of being a coach to the next, like whoever the current group of kids are. Uh, in fact, about three weeks ago, we had our selection camp. So with a, a bunch of tests and lectures where we're going to choose the team for the upcoming uh, International Maths Olympiad, which is going to be hosted in Russia, but because of COVID, it's actually happening online. Uh, so I'm still involved as a coach from the other side now. Uh, yeah, which brings me into what I'm doing now. I finished my PhD end of 2019, graduated in April last year. And since July, I've been lecturing at Stellenbosch University. Sorry, when I look this way, just because I'm looking at the maths building where I lecture over there. Um, which is quite a great thing. Uh, I've known since about grade 11, grade 12 that I wanted to be a lecturer eventually. So got here eventually. So that's enough about me. Let's talk about learning how to learn mathematics. So from, from being a primary or high school student, uh, getting through to being a master's or PhD student, there's a sort of sequence of learning that happens there. I'm only going to focus on one of the transitions uh, in that sequence. And the transition I'm focusing on is from when you're being taught, like let's say there's material uh, you're being taught about the quadratic formula or about uh, vector spaces or whatever the case is. When I say being taught, I mean there's someone in front of you that tells you this is a vector space, these are the axioms of a vector space, these are properties, 
and then uh, showing some theorems about vector spaces with examples and so on. So that's what I mean by being taught. Whereas when you get to the point of doing uh, to the level of research mathematics, the idea is that you should be able to, um, other than finding or solving existing problems or doing research in that way, you should also be able to learn what the state of the art is in a particular area of mathematics. For example, I may have, I think I did an honors or master's course in measure theory, which so like I now know what a measure is, but I'm not an expert in the area at all. Uh, but if I wanted to do a paper which is related to or in that field, I could, I would have to learn by myself uh, the more advanced parts of measure theory, for instance. So the way I see it, the transition happens quite late because uh, even in undergraduate mathematics, like maybe I'm wrong here, with a lot of what I'm saying about learning mathematics, I'm not a maths education expert, but so this is mostly just from my experience. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. But I think even in undergraduate mathematics, most of the maths gets taught that rather than teaching the students how to learn from by themselves. And this is actually one of the things that happened for me back in, uh, in high school because of doing this Olympiad mathematics, I got to the point of like independent learning uh, back in high school already, which made learning maths in university and beyond much easier. So uh, as examples of, I thought I would do two examples of the kind of stuff that I learned in high school, which I might only have learned otherwise in university mathematics. And I'll do two examples to illustrate two different techniques. I'm just going to share a, actually I can just annotate over here. I'll share an example of what I learned. One of the things that I learned in high school, or rather than learned that I kind of taught myself was on the topic of using complex numbers in geometry problems. Uh, so in Olympiad mathematics, one of the main areas would be geometry, and usually it would be something like they would give you a particular description of points and lines, maybe probably some triangles, there's some circles there, and you're asked to prove some statement, like maybe these three points are always collinear, or uh, these three lines are concurrent, or finding the length of this particular segment or whatever the case may be. So, sorry, can you share whiteboard? Yeah, just clear that. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna have to go back to the share quickly. There we go. So, say for instance, you have a triangle, and I happen to just draw an equilateral triangle. And when you use complex numbers in a geometry problem, you would usually give complex number values to each of your corner points, let's say A, B, and C, and you would then write whichever other points or line or lines that you have or so on in terms of these complex numbers a b and c for example uh, you might be interested in what is a formula for the circumcenter and the circumcenter if you don't know is the center of the circle that goes through those three vertices So formula 
for second center. Uh, let's give it a name. Uh, R? No, R is not a good idea. Uh, let's do S. Okay. So, uh, as you guys would know the properties of a circle, of course, uh, we know that the distance from our circumcenter S to each of those vertices have to be the same. So for example, uh, S minus A, so the distance from S to A would be the modulus of S minus A is equal to the modulus of S minus B, for instance. And I can square both sides and use the fact that for complex numbers, the modulus squared is just the number multiplied by its conjugate. So that's S minus A times S bar minus A bar is S minus B, S bar minus B bar. And you can multiply this out and uh, take some terms to the left hand side. So take all the terms with S and S bar to the left hand side, all the other terms to the right hand side. And what we'll end up with is S times B bar minus A bar. Uh, plus S bar times B minus A equals B, B bar minus A, A bar. Unless I made a mistake, you've got that equation over there. And uh, now you can do, so far we only used the fact that the distance from S to A is the same as the distance from S to B. We can do the same thing from uh, that the distance from S to A is the same as the distance from S to C. So S times C bar minus A bar, S bar C minus A, is C, C bar minus A, A bar. And here we have two equations uh, right there in front of us, and we have two unknowns. Even though S and S bar are related, so, uh, but from the point of view of this linear equation, we can treat them as independent unknowns, S and S bar, and we can solve this equation with uh, two equations with two unknowns, and we can get the formula for S. So S equals is some fraction, I don't remember the details exactly right now, but you have some expression with A, B and C on top, some expression with A, B and C at the bottom. Now, when I was learning how to use complex numbers in geometry, I didn't have this formula right at the end uh, that actually gives S in terms of A, B and C but I knew some basics about complex numbers. I knew uh, the distance between one point and another would be the modulus of the difference between them. I knew that, okay, the square of that distance would just be, well, the square of any complex number would be that complex number times its conjugate. And I knew some properties of the conjugate like adding, sorry, adding the conjugate of two numbers is just the sum of each conjugate and multiplying and so on. Basically that the conjugate is a field automorphism of the complex numbers. Well, back then I wouldn't use those words, but I would describe it that way now. So in that way, I had to build up from those small pieces that I knew and I had to build up to get to the point of, I know what the formula for the circumcenter of a triangle is. And we can do a similar type thing for uh, finding the orthocenter of a triangle, for instance. Uh, for those who don't know, the orthocenter is the intersection of the perpendicular bisectors. Sorry, that's supposed to be a point there. Orthocenter is the intersection of the perpendicular bisectors, not perpendicular bisectors, the altitudes of a triangle. Um, and there's a similar formula that you can get for that. 
And you also get that formula by building up your building up from small statements that you know about complex numbers in order to get a formula for the auto center. So this is what I mean by building up. You would know some small pieces of mathematics and use that to build up to a formula which you might just get given if you were being taught mathematics. Or if you're being taught, you might be taken through the der this derivation of the formula for uh, the circumcenter of a triangle. Okay, I'm just gonna close that and go back to the presentation. Another kind of thing would be filling in the details. Um, more specifically, what I mean by that would be uh, translating mathematical thought to formal expression. So here, uh, you guys would like you you're all familiar with the concept of a pair. So when we say a pair, uh, a and B of two elements. Now, the when I say the mathematical thought, I mean, what do we want this pair construction to satisfy? Uh, well, we would want that if one pair is equal to another pair, let's say C and D, that can only happen if A equals C and B equals D. Uh, so that's for an unordered pair, that's what we want. Now, when I was in first year, for instance, uh, we had a, I think an introduction to set theory, first or second year, I think it was first year. We had an introduction to set theory class. And in that set theory class, we were given a, a formal definition of a pair. I'm sure there are other ones which have this property as well. Uh, but we were given, it was something along the lines of the pair A and B for any two sets A and B is defined as the set containing the set containing A and B with the set containing A. It was something, something like that. I might have the details slightly mixed up. And then uh, we would define a pair in this way, and then from then we were able to prove this property that we want, that one pair is equal to another pair if and only if the first elements and the second elements respectively are equal. So when I say the mathematical thought, um, I mean the first part, this is the pair should have, pair it would be anything really that works, that has this property where that I just mentioned, the formal expression, which can sometimes be more opaque, would be this formal definition of a pair. Now, I think sometimes when people are taught mathematics, they are taught the formal expression. Uh, this is what a pair is, or this is the quadratic formula, and you given there's the quadratic formula in front of you or something like that. Um, and not really the mathematical thought doesn't get brought across that well. So I learned to learn mathematical or learn how to learn mathematics by knowing the thought before the actual formal expression. Another example would be uh, something that I sort of learned, and I, I say sort of learned because I didn't learn the actual details, but I remember in grade 12 or something, I sort of learned how uh, complex integration works. Uh, so stuff like, um, what is it, Newton's formula, I think it's called. Anyway, when you have a complex function, let's say f of z, and you have some contour that you're integrating along, 
uh, and if you know that your function f of z is entire and you have a point a inside or that falls inside this contour then of course the integral of f of z over z minus a dz over this contour c would give you the value f of a now when i i saw this formula and i had a vague idea of how integration works like an integration on the real line when i saw this formula i was by looking at the formula and what it uh, I didn't know the details, specific details of how complex integration was defined, but from seeing the formula, I was able to figure out, okay, it's probably basically the same definition. You break up the contour into little pieces and you, uh, this dz, so you have some sort of limit as the number of pieces goes to infinity and this integral uh, becomes this uh, the integrand multiplied by little changes in z and so i was able by seeing these sort of uh, do i say formulas for complex integration i was able to morally figure out uh, how complex integration was defined i didn't have the formal expression to use an earlier word but i had the mathematical thought and so when I got to the point of, I think it was third year, maybe second year of having a complex analysis course, then of course I learned the actual, the nitty gritty of uh, uh, all these little complex uh, analysis theorems, which actually underpin and make sure that the rest of it works properly. I learned all of the precise material, but I had the mathematical thought earlier on. Okay, let's clear that and move on to the next. Now, um, I am aware that, at least in my experience of mathematics, maybe not in other areas, I have been very privileged by my uh, high school experience of competition mathematics and how that has made learning mathematics in university level and beyond much easier. Uh, so I'm quite privileged in that area, but I would like for other people to also experience this privilege when they are learning mathematics, whether in high school or possibly even, oh, sorry, whether in university or possibly even in high school. And here are some ideas that I have about how we could implement this when teaching mathematics uh, to help students to learn how to learn mathematics by themselves. Uh, I'm not an expert in math education uh, at all, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on these. Uh, here's the first one. Uh, when introducing a mathematical result or theory, uh, try to communicate the thought before the the formal the mathematical thought before the formal expression um, and try to really make sure that the students understand the thought uh, before the expression or another way of thinking about it understanding the why before the how uh, for instance if you're teaching the quadratic formula uh, the expression would be the actual formula minus b plus minus the square root of the discriminant over 2a whereas the thought would be i have a quadratic uh, equation i would like to solve it i maybe know how to solve equations of the form x squared equals a number that's where the square roots come from uh, can i take a general quadratic expression and sort of bring it into that form of x squared equals something so that by going via that I can learn how to solve a general quadratic uh, equation. Uh, there are probably better examples for this. So one issue with this, of course, is that it takes more time to reinforce the thought before bringing the expression and 
time is something that is a valuable resource, especially when you've got a lot of material to get through. Uh, but if the time is invested earlier, like in my case, I the the time of learning mathematical thought in high school uh, was invested there. It made the rest of my university learning experience much easier. And uh, the second idea that I could have in how to apply these lessons in teaching mathematics is to give students exercises where they are expected to derive a particular formula or equation or principle or whatever by themselves. Uh, there's a little uh, grammar error over there, not by in small groups, just in small groups or by themselves. Uh, for instance, uh, using the topic of quadratic formula, I suppose. Uh, let's say you have some students in grade 10, I think. I think that's when they usually get taught it, who have not seen the quadratic formula yet. And then uh, maybe give them a quadratic equation and give or get across the idea that they are supposed to figure out how to solve it themselves. Um, I think the fact that if students are expected to do something, at least in my mind, if someone is given the, the message that they are expected to do something or to be able to do something, that at least gives them the idea that they are able to do it because the teacher wouldn't expect me to do this if I wasn't able to do it. So I think giving students, whether in high school or university, the expectation that they're supposed to do something or be able to do something by themselves, I think that would actually empower them to do it. Uh, of course, deriving something like the quadratic formula by oneself is not necessarily an easy thing to do. Uh, so this derivation that they would essentially do by themselves can be guided in different ways. Uh, so you could start off with small derivations that they would figure out how to do themselves and then as the years go by move on to larger uh, derivations. Cool, until we get to the point of uh, in university level mathematics where students are expected to uh, do a proof of a result and that would actually become much easier when they get to that point. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, listening to the seminar. I hope it's thought provoking and I hope you have a lot to say now. Um. Thank you very much, Liam, um, for your presentation, you know, definitely something that's um, kind of general interest and really relevant um, to a lot of us. And I've noticed like at a very large amount of our postgrads have joined today. We've got a very big audience today. Augustine Munagi from WIT, please um, unmute and come forward with your question and turn your video on as well. That'd be nice. Thank you. Let me give the video. <laughs> yeah, good morning. Uh, hi, Liam. <laughs> hi, Augustine. A long time to see. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, uh, yeah. This uh, thought-provoking discussion, and um, uh, um, you touched on something. And now, I know there are some people who talk about the mathematics teaching and learning. Um, I have actually had somebody some years ago talk about imitation talk about imitation, that you just have to imitate. Uh, and um, you just give it to them, let them imitate. And they, if they imitate and they imitate, they will learn, they will understand it. And I know that that is not where you stand right now. Um, yeah. and so how do you reconcile uh, the idea of imitation, uh, you know? Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile it with your, with your viewpoint? Yeah. Yeah. I think if, uh, let's say there's a teacher standing in front of a class of students or a lecturer, and, uh, and the teacher is 
for the lecturers, I don't know, solving a differential equation. So showing the students how to do this sort of thing, uh, whatever the topic is, and the teachers on the board and the, using the whiteboard or the blackboard, and they're showing the steps to go through when solving a differential equation. And then the students could, maybe they have an exercise book with a bunch of exercises on the same topic, uh, differential equations with like different numbers put in at different places, and they could imitate the lecturer and they could learn, they could practice the steps basically. So they learn how to uh, practice the steps, sort of like in playing football, you're learning how to kick a ball. Uh, but I think imitation, at most, it's mostly good for learning how to do something like how to solve a differential equation of a particular kind. But I think it doesn't help so much with learning why. Like what's the actual, what's the why behind this kind of differential equation? Um, so I think imitation is good for how and for learning a routine, but not as much for learning actual understanding. At least that's my viewpoint. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Leopold? Hello, how are you, Liam? I'm good, how are you doing? Well, I'm good, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. It's an eye-opener. Um, I just a comment, or oh, it's not a question or a, you can take it as a question, but as you have said that the starting point will be communicating the thought. Uh, what I feel is also a challenge when someone is learning maths by himself or by herself is the misunderstood words, or we can call it terminology. Uh, take for instance, someone is studying real analysis. They talk something like uh, an open set, how do we uh, identify an open set and a closed set? Mm -hmm. So when you look at the word open in everyday usage of the word, uh, it's used to describe some physical scenario of an object, mm -hmm. let's say a container, yeah. or which is maybe a cylinder is open at one end. And then in another mm -hmm. scenario, you may find that that term is used in a unusual way as from mathematics. So you find that some terms which are used in mathematics and when you look at the usage in the everyday language, they seem to differ. Uh, for example, uh, differentiation is another example. Differentiate, yeah. whereas we know in our everyday usage of language, when someone says differentiate, maybe you have to look at the differences between two items. But now when we go to yeah. maths, it becomes uh, something else. So this is one thing which I've observed that sometimes students struggle. Uh, because of these misunderstood words. So I just feel maybe there's also need to, to have clarity on it. And I normally encourage mm -hmm. students to have a mathematics dictionary so that they are able, they're in a position to decipher the terminology which is used. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that comment. And it's definitely a, a case in other uh, mathematical uh, things as well. Like, I know in algebra, there's top, uh, terms like ring and field and uh, domain and such like that, where, which has a, one specific meaning in real life, but in mathematics, it has a completely different meaning. So yeah, some kind of uh, math dictionary is a good point. Um, but I think another comment I would make on learning or self-led learning, I think that it shouldn't necessarily be learning in isolation, um, but it should be learning that's led by yourself, but hopefully within a, a bigger community where uh, let's say I'm learning about, um, I don't know, ring theory, and um, I'm learning a particular area or section, and I'm having trouble with, uh, some uh, theory or some concept or proof or something, I could reach out if I'm in a bigger community of people, 
I could reach out to someone else and like, hey, can you help me with, uh, I don't know, one of these uh, Noether's theorems or something like that? Or what, what exactly is the, the, can you explain the, the concept of a crawl dimension of a ring, for instance? Um, so I think self-led learning works well when you're in a community of people who are hopefully also self-learning by themselves as well. Uh, but there would be people who would be able to help you when you're struggling or have a misunderstanding of a particular concept. We have a comments and a question in the chat from Yugen from UKZN. And they say, the comment says, thank you for your interesting talk. Your experience speaks to concepts like scaffolding, for example, building up, and epistemological access, uh, and in brackets, it says Wally Morrow, to concepts. My question, maths is a very emotional subject, especially when you are battling to solve a problem. How do you cope with not being able to solve a problem? Um, uh, I remember I was in honors, I think it was, and uh, there, there aren't very many maths competitions for university level students, but there is one which is pretty international. Uh, it's hosted every year in Bulgaria. And I was at this uh, maths competition uh, with a lecturer from UCT because we were part of the UCT team at that point. And I remember he said something that stuck with me because I just find it so strange. Uh, he said, uh, part of the experience of being a professional mathematician is learning how to be frustrated. Because uh, as, as he said it, you would have a problem that you're trying to work on or a problem that you're trying to solve. And like 99% of the time, or maybe 95, depending on how good you are, uh, you would feel like you're making no progress on the problem. And then suddenly there would be this like moment where you have the realization and suddenly all the, the doors open and you and, and like, and then suddenly the, the understanding like bounce or jumps forward when you have that moment of understanding. Um, so I think part of when I'm struggling to figure out a problem, uh, part of it is having the wisdom to realize that the time you spend, uh, at least for me, the time that I spend uh, seemingly butting my head against something is actually building up my intuition for how the theory works as a whole. Um, for example, with my PhD, there was a problem that I was given at the start of the PhD to work on. Um, and I made a little bit of progress, but I didn't actually solve the problem for like 80% of the PhD was just me trying different stuff and failing and trying this other thing and failing, and I'm not able to solve this problem. But then, when I actually found something else interesting that was interesting in that area and I proceeded to make my PhD on that related topic or the understanding that I had built up knocking my head against the wall actually helped me to like the, the other 20% of doing this other part which ended up being my PhD was much easier because I spent all that time butting my head and not being able to solve the problem I was trying to solve. So I think part of it is the understanding that uh, even when you feel like you're butting your head and not having any progress, there is progress that you're just not seeing. Um, maybe another comment I would make with how do I cope with the emotions of not solving a problem? Um, yeah, some other things I would say is don't make the problem your whole life. Uh, you could be working on other things as well. Uh, go for a walk outside. 
uh, often just a change of scenery uh, helps to freshen the mind and also have some other problems to work on as well. If you may be working on four or five problems at the same time, when you get tired of one, you can switch to the other one. Um, yeah, just switch to wherever you feel like you have ideas which could be like carried out and see if they work. So yeah, um, like having small wins with easier problems can bolster your confidence to go back to the harder problem that you're trying to work on. Maybe that's some ideas perhaps. Great, thank you. Um, Jürgen's actually sent a, a, a kind of a follow-up question um, and one that I was thinking of as well. And they say, so for our students, how do we teach them to persevere? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, in my experience with uh, high school students, I think because of the way they're being taught, um, they are expected to solve a, they, yeah, they are expected to be able to solve a problem immediately. Like when they're given, if they've been taught the quadratic formula and they're given a quadratic equation, the expectation from the teacher is that they would be able to do it immediately. So I think one of the core things is to just be clear with the expectation that we're not expecting you to do this immediately. And we're not expecting you to know how to solve this problem as soon as you look at it. And that's one of the things I loved about Olympiad Maths and about Maths Now is that you can be presented with a problem and you don't have an immediate idea of how to go about solving it. You might have one or two ideas of attacking, but you don't know if it would work or not. So I think, I think being clear and communicating with the students, okay, I'm going to give you a problem and this problem is not going to be easy, like you can do it in 30 seconds or whatever. Um, I'm, I'm not expecting you to do it in 30 seconds. If you can, that's great. Um, but I'm expecting you to work for a while on this and with time you will solve it. I think communicating expectations is key especially when they've built up the expectation over years of being taught in a different way, when they've built up the expectation that you're supposed to know how to do it immediately. Great, thank you so much, Liam. Um, great, Darlinson, Darlison, sorry, from Vits, please come forward, unmute uh, your microphone and turn on your video and ask your question. Yeah, m maybe mine could be a question or a comment, uh, whichever way. Um, I would like to agree with, uh, th okay, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Liam, for a very nice presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, perhaps the approach which um, you are talking about is um, th th there should be something done before we implement that strategy, in my view. Okay. Why? Because um, if you look at most of our students, if not all of them, at both levels, high school as well as um, university, perhaps let me start with high school. The way mathematics is taught seem to suggest that as long as they've passed an exam, that's the end of it. So they the, the, the focus on exams, 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 erodes away the actual idea that uh, you need to understand, uh, mm -hmm. you know, mathematics and enjoy it anyway. So with that mentality, it's not easy to <laughs> convince a student that, you know what, I really want you to understand. Yeah. So it's like the orientation is all about memorize, pass an exam, memorize, pass an exam. That's why I think Prof. Augustine Nagi came in to say, how do you look into the idea of imitation and all that, which of course on its own is, is perfect. 
-hmm. However, if it is done in the view of passing an exam, then we have a problem in actually implementing that brilliant strategy which you have emphasized on. So that was just my comment. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. I think you you spoke the truth there. Um, uh, of course, people from the other side might say, "Well, I mean, we need to have some sort of way of measuring whether a student is competent on the material that has been taught to them." Um, and yeah, I guess. I mean, we don't want to get rid of exams completely, but what we could maybe do is change the kind of questions that get asked in an exam. Um, so maybe an exam would be more something where students are given more time to do the exam, uh, but there's at least a part of the exam where they are uh, asked to solve essentially asked to solve a problem that they don't know how to do immediately. Um, and they would have to maybe do their own derivation or whatever the case may be in order to figure out how to solve this problem. So uh, maybe part of the answer would be changing how exams work uh, instead of a two and a half hour thing where you're not allowed to look at your notes or anything. Uh, Personally, I think people should be allowed to look at their notes during exams, but that's a whole nother issue. Yeah. So teaching for an exam is definitely an issue. Maybe a move in the right direction would be changing how exams are done. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Thank you so much, Darlison. Um, Liam. Hi, yep. it's Diane from COE Mass here. Um, I actually have a question I'd like to ask you. Oh no. If that's okay. No, no, no. <laughs> so kidding, so it's related to my background. So I, I have I have some background in 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 sort of teaching, um, perhaps not in the traditional sense that we think of, um, as oh. well as tutoring. Um with thrown in with a bit of lecturing as well um and i just wanted to ask you, you you talked about students expectations or learners expectations earlier uh -huh. and i was wondering um if you might just just for a minute comment on your own i was curious to know your own expectations um, comparing your initial coaching experience in olympiads with with now lecturing Yeah. Um, I think in my experience with the coaching of Olympiad maths, it's much more hands off, or at least like hands off from above. So when a coach, at least with the Olympiad maths, when a coach walks into a room and plans to do something with the students, uh, there's not much uh, direction given from above about how exactly that should be done. Uh, so there's more freedom from that point of view to to do strange things like, I don't know, put up a problem and have the students work on it for half an hour and, and just like walk among them and nudge them in the right direction, for example. Um, whereas in my experience, like I don't have that much experience with uh, university like lecturing. Uh, usually universities like Stellenbosch has been around for more than 100 years. Like there's a certain way things are done. I think it'll be similar in most universities. Like this is how lecturing gets done. This is how tutorials gets done. So there is more of a pressure to like fit into the established, this is how we do things when lecturing at a university. Yeah. Um, so it's possibly harder to change things when you're lecturing at a university, um, okay. as opposed to when I'm doing coaching stuff. Uh, but small changes are better than no changes, I think. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for that answer and for um, you know, your viewpoint on that.